Yeah, she's a mum, but she'll have a kid. <laughs> I was saying that. Hang on, hang on. Let me not put up the lady on this too quickly. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Buzz Harrison, and I'm the head of School of Global no, I don't. I work with Maya. Um, so, a big welcome to all of you, and also a welcome to um, apparently the people who are all around the world watching this as well, because this is being live streamed on Facebook. Um, I've been asked at the very beginning to ask you all to tweet any comments, anything you, you want to say about the lecture with the hashtag. She looks for it. Hashtag Sussex Dead. She's got in there already, don't you? Anyway, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Maya, Professor Maya Yunfan, who's um, a colleague of mine in the studies, um, Professor of um, and your professor in medical anthropology. Social and medical anthropology. Social and medical anthropology. Um, Maya is a um, really renowned international scholar in the field of um, medical anthropology, reproductive rights in particular, and has done a lot of work on um, fertility and infertility. She's um, published very widely, written and then write seven books, or co-authored, many, many, many books. Um, um, and is increasingly um, engaged in, um, in, in policy work, and I was uh, telling you that she's uh, got, uh, uh, going to visit the WHO next week, for example. Um, my work has mainly been in North East India, um, although more recently has been uh, working with uh, in the UK, um, and also on issues of uh, migration with regard to reproductive rights. Um, we're really lucky as well because she also teaches lots of our um, courses within local studies. Um, particularly, we have, a, uh, we have a big course on health, poverty, and inequality, which is one of the best received courses we have within the school. Fantastic teacher. Anyway, um, I think it's over to you, my own goes and over there in the corner, you have approximately one hour, and then we have about half an hour. Thanks, Buzz, uh, for that sort of wonderful introduction. And uh, uh, it's put the stakes up so much, you know, I just hope I'm going to deliver uh, something um, that speaks to that. And thanks, everyone, for being here, you know, cold dark <coughs> evening. Uh, I'm really happy to see, see everyone here. So um, I'm just going to basically offer some of my reflections on um, the connections between um, the, the Sustainable Development Goals and um, Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. So um, let's start at you know at the at, at the start um, in, in the sense that um, I'm not assuming that uh, you're all people. Even though you're a number of you are here at IDS, that you may know um, everything about the development goals, even I don't. Uh, they are uh, the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them, and they are like you know 169 targets. Um, the interesting thing about these sustainable development goals are it, it's, it sets out, and this is what it says in in the 41-page document that these goals are really, they represent a supremely ambitious and transformational vision um, to eradicate poverty, mainly, so poverty is really central, the eradication of poverty, but also in which gender equality um, is central. So, um, and, and I think that this, this is, you know, constructed or framed in a way, I and mean, that's why I want to start with this, which is to really show that um, gender equality, that is the goal, SDG goal 5, sits very much at the heart of, uh, of all these other 17 goals. Um, the report in general, uh, it covers three dimensions of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. And it also is a kind of um, a development document agenda that crosses all countries. Not, it's not just about the Global South, but it's also about 
uh, the global north. So it's about you know north and south. It is global in that sense. But one of the things that's really interested me about this document and vision is that it is really for the first time that human rights are being linked to broader development goals. Um, and, and so one of the things I'm going to do in the talk is really look at this kind of relationship, look at how uh, they, they come together. In particular, and um, I'm going to focus on um, the issue of sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not just one goal, therefore, that I'm looking at, because sexual and reproductive health and rights is set within, it's kind of diffused and dispersed, although mainly within the gender equality goal, MDG, uh, SDG 5, uh, it's also set in a broader vision of, of across several other goals. And, and these development goals I have specifically put out here. This is uh, also the um, IPPF, the International Planned Parenthood Federation document on this, from which I've taken this. Um, but it, it shows how sexual and reproductive health and rights are connected, particularly in the sustainable development goals, um, coming, you know, particularly within gender equality, but also connected with uh, goals three on good health and well-being on goal four, which is quality education, on goal six, which is to do with water, um, on goal eight, which is about work and economic growth, um, on goal 10, on reduced inequalities, and on goal 16, which is about peace and justice and strong institutions. So you can already begin to see how sexual and productive <laughs> health and rights are being framed in, in this kind of document. So what I what I like to do today, Ben, is really to look at, and this is you know given the fact that um, human rights and development have very different approaches to gender equality, I really want to then look at how do these come together? How do these ideas around rights and development work together for reproductive health? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I'm saying this because um, rights, human rights, in particular the legal kind of framework of human rights, focuses a lot on individual entitlement, and that's what's taken into the notion of gender equality. Whereas development goals generally think about aggregate welfare, that is common welfare for people when you have these goals. So how do these two things come together? The focus on the individual and entitlements with the focus on the collective and welfare. So that's what I'd like to look at and I want to address that through this notion of uh, reproductive health um, and reproductive health and rights. And so what in the next couple of minutes I'd like to do is you know, tell you a little bit on what has been done, how it's addressed in, in the goals, uh, but also perhaps a little bit of what else and what more can be done. And particularly on that second aspect, I'd like to talk about two kinds of issues. One is the way in which sort of gender equality itself has been approached and again looking at it through sort of feminist ethical principles and uh, particularly in that context my guru is Rosalind Pajeski who's written a lot on, on these kinds of issues. Um, and the second thing I'd like to do is really look at, you know, rights itself and how rights have come into this document, reproductive, sexual rights and justice, and thinking about it from a more kind of anthropological approach. So again, drawing on Pachewski's work, drawing on Pig's work, and you know, the work that I've been doing um, in, in India. So that's my kind of plan. Um, so to start out, then I think it's really important to look historically at the development of some of these ideas. And I want to start really with um, the looking at how the idea of rights in reproductive health or reproductive health have developed and what has been the journey of, of this kind of concept called reproductive health um, and sexual reproductive rights in, in development. 
so within, um, and I'm sure you've all heard, heard about you know, the Population Development Conference in Cairo in 1994, uh, where for the first time, I mean, it was that moment um, was kind of historic because, you know, it, for the first time, we had the shift away from the demographic kind of paradigm of, of development. So we had a move from sort of population um, focused to people focused sort of ideas. Um, it was also a moment which you could record as, you know, resulting from transnational collaboration, particularly transnational collaboration of feminists um, uh, across the global north and south who had come together to push for uh, uh, push for this particular agenda of rights uh, at this population and development conference. So in, it was it was decided uh, at this meeting in '94 that you know the human rights of women will include the right to control over and decide freely and responsibly on matters related to their sexuality, including sexual and reproductive health. There's going to be freedom of coercion. They will have you know, freedom of coercion, of discrimination and violence. And that there will be equal relationships between women and men in matters of sexual relations and reproduction, including full respect for the integrity of the person. So this is all very kind of forward language that we are seeing already in 1994. Where you know, it talks about mutual respect, it talks about consent, it talks about shared responsibility for sexual behavior and its consequences. So there's a lot of forward thinking that um, came up, you know, at that time. And this, this kind of uh, definition, as it were, was agreed then a year later at the Beijing platform for uh, Declaration Platform for Action, the fourth conference in, in Beijing. Um, so the this particular moment where reproductive health and rights were brought together as being central for development was, as I said, a historic moment. It made us shift, you know, it, it led to a complete shift in thinking, you know, about how health is not a matter of fertility uh, in countries. It's a matter for, it's a social good. Um, you know, it's important. It, and also that there is a gender and power perspective here. So, um, however, what what was then, you know, in a, in a report that came out ten years later, um, where um, and this was the UNFPA State of the World Population Report, um, there was a lot of disappointment that um, despite having this kind of global agenda. And uh, despite the commitment of states to work for for um, these kind of rights and reproductive health, um, there was uh, you know there were a lot of sort of limitations. There was a lot of rhetoric, for instance, in a lot of states. Um, you could, you could see a lot of uh, countries that um, uh, there was a change in the language around certain programs to do with sort of you know fertility programs or family planning programs were called safe motherhood programs. So there was a lot of shift in sort of the naming and the rhetoric of programs, but there was very little in terms of implementation. Um, there was also, you know, a lot of um, a backlash to sexual and reproductive health rights. And these are all things that we need to keep in mind because it hasn't gone away. This is still what we are fighting even today. Um, and that led to, you know, very poor implementation on the ground. The backlash was from people who don't believe in, uh, you know, these kind of rights, sexual and health rights. Um, and, and this could be people in government. This could be entrenched kind of patriarchal um, uh, uh, kind of groups. They could be religious fundamentalist groups. So uh, this this is all, you know, it led to uh, a stalling on on the realization of these kind of rights. Um, and you find that despite the shift to people-centered uh, development, uh, we still have population targets. Um, and again, these targets are influencing health workers, and uh, they again remove uh, this, this notion of uh, person-centered and individual choice. 
Also, the kinds of choice that was set out um, in, in the Beijing kind of declaration, um, you, you find that the kinds of choices were very limited. They were more for the termination of fertility than for the celebration of, of birth and time. Um, and similarly, the focus was so much, you know, reproductive health and sexual health was all about so the maternal health and the focus was on birth in these programs that came on after Cairo. Um, and, you know, there was very little attention to the reproductive health of men or, uh, the re you know, sexual health of younger, um, uh, younger sort of adolescents or the elderly population. There was the invisibility of infertility. It was all a focus on kind of, you know, birth and fertility. Um, and along with infertility, also the fact that a lot of infertility may be caused by reproductive tract infections. So again, healthcare was very, very poor. One of the really kind of uh, major issues was the lack of attention to sexual rights, to sexual health, to sexual identities. So after this, um, you know, given this, this was this was in 2004, and as it happened, I was doing some work in India in 1998. Um, I was working with. I spent a year then. Um, working with women in Rajasthan, so these were kind of poor Sunni Muslim women and also lower caste Hindu women who were living, you know, in marginal contexts, either on the outskirts of the city or in, or in the slum areas. Um, and I was talking to them about what reproductive health meant for them, um, what kind of services uh, were they, you know, did they have, and what what did did they have any kind of sexual or reproductive freedom, freedom in deciding how many children they have? Um, and one of the people who actually represents quite a number of, of you know, people who I met there was, was Zahida. And for Zahida, you know, whatever she told me, one of the sort of main um, issues for her was everything was kind of framed in this very sort of sentence where she said, Ek bihoshi me do kaam. That means in one bout of anesthesia, two jobs are being done on my body. So, and this really represents at that time the focus of the state on sterilization. The kind of coercive uh, way in which particularly women's reproductive um, uh, functions were being controlled by the state. Um, and this was, this focus on sterilization was sort of everywhere. It was everywhere to see. It was in campaigns by the government, it was in camps set out by the government, it was in hospital context. So a lot of women who were really poor, like Zaida, were, were giving birth in private hospitals because of the fear that at this, you know, at birth they would be sterilized. In two jobs would be done in one bout of consciousness. Ekhi Bihoshi um, And then it wasn't just that, but post sterilization, there was very little care you know, in, in the hospitals. And so post-sterilization deaths were really a, a reality. So people were dying in childbirth before giving birth, but they were also dying once they had been sterilized. In terms of contraception, they were, um, you know, people didn't want to use condoms, they didn't want to use pills, and very few people used intrauterine devices. A very few women used intrauterine devices. Um, in terms of even abortion services, um, there was, you know, um, there was very little uh, local provision of this. There was no abortion service, and most of the people sought them, and particularly unmarried girls sought them um, within, um, you know, un what are considered unsafe contexts because these are, you know, outside um, the, the the public health um, uh, kind of hospitals and contexts. Um, and, and it was also a time where there was an increasing rise of private provision for um, selective abortion. And this was particularly what women were um, wanting to go in for. Because there was a sense of, you know, development is connected with having perhaps not just smaller families, but being able to educate the children that you do have. And so in order to do that, you want to have a smaller family but you do want to have one son. So selective abortion was something that was, um, you know, that, that, that there was a preference for um, at, you know, at that point. 
Um, so let's just shift then. So that was happening between this post Cairo kind of context and before this development of the Millennium Development Goals that were set out then in 2005 over the span of kind of 10 years. Um, and the idea really with the Millennium Development Goals was to address precisely the issues that people like Zayda were facing in their kind of household um, context. Um, the Millennium Development Goals, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time because I want to get on to the Sustainable Development Goals, but I think it's really important particularly to see some things that we, that we can take along with us and try to understand this as a broader narrative of, of development, particularly around reproductive health and sexual health and rights. So the, the Millennium Development Goals had only a few goals, right? There were kind of eight goals, as, as you know, um, and they had, um, they were, uh, they, they, they were very simply put together, you know, it was about poverty, it was about education, maternal health, child health, um, water, uh, etc. So, but, but one of the things that um, um, a lot of sort of people who've analyzed these Millennium Development Goals have said is that sexual reproductive health again was narrowed down to just maternal health. So again, you find that what was discussed and agreed at Cairo, there's so much being left out. Again, all those limitations, all the information we had, you know, is was was not being addressed. So, um, so yes, it's good to have a simple message. It's good to have a message that people understand and people know how to kind of um, address. But what gets left out? That's also really important. That kind of framing becomes really important. Um, and what what does this narrowing down to maternal health? What kind of implications does it have for the processes of development, the tools, techniques, and instruments that are that emerge around development? <coughs> and I will just kind of talk about you know one or two. And one was really that with this focus on maternal health, it actually became this focus <coughs> on maternal mortality. And the indicator was very much the maternal mortality rate. Um, and, and so that even, that just became in fact an outcome in itself. So just seeing what levels of maternal mortality or the maternal mortality rate was then what people were striving for. And that became the measure of progress, the measure of development. Um, Sally Engel Mary, an anthropologist, has done a lot of work on um, looking at what she calls the distorting effects of quantitative indicators. And that's precisely it. They leave out, they flatten a lot of things like inequalities, for instance, uh, or anything to do with sort of, you know, the inter interpretive, embodied, subjective kind of ways in which people experience healthcare, which is so important. And then the other thing is, where are rights in this kind of document? Um, you know, again, post Cairo, this is quite far, you know, quite away from from the Cairo and the Beijing platforms. And you know, where are rights again? Where are they addressed? How are they addressed? And then issues were say were coming up. Okay, well, how do we measure rights? Because if you focus on indicators, then you know you need a measure of whatever you put in, including rights. So, how do you measure rights? Can you measure rights? Is it this much or that much? <laughs> how many, how much, you know, think about yourself and think about rights in that kind of context. So I think, you know, these were some of the kind of things that come out from the Millennium, millennium Development Goals, which were actually quick to be seen. So, two years later, they quickly added a target. Along with Millennium MDG 5, they added MDG 5B. And MDG 5B was really about bringing in reproductive health, because even reproductive health was missing, right? It was only on maternal health. So bringing in reproductive health. But bringing it in, again, in terms of particular kinds of indicators, health service indicators. 
So looking at contraceptive prevalence, how many people use what kind of um, you know, contraceptives, um, what was the acceptance rate, um, looking at adolescent birth, birth rate, you know, teenage pregnancy, looking at antenatal coverage, how many people before, how many women before giving birth were, you know, consuming iron folic acid tablets, were having antenatal, you know, uh, checkups, um, and then also looking at what was called unmet need. So again, you see the development of particular kinds of indicators and particular kind of language, unmet need for family planning. So here's family planning, again, it never goes away. The, the family planning and the idea that the state plans your family. Family planning is about how the state plans your family, right? It's not about sitting down on the table, everybody in a family and say, we have, you know, we'll do this, we'll have so many children. No, it's about the state uh, sort of planning your family. So again, NDG 5B focused on this. They did also collect data or they, they promoted the idea of collecting data on skilled birth attendance. And this was because WHO, after, you know, in 2005 said maternal mortality is, you know, why we have high levels of maternal mortality? Because we have unskilled birth attendance, traditional birth attendance. And so all those programs were wrapped up in these various countries and now we had skilled birth attendance. And they were going to reduce maternal mortality. Um, in all of this, there was also a complete and notable absence of unsafe abortion. And unsafe abortion is one of the key kind of factors that cause maternal mortality. So again, and, and there, was, there was evidence of that, but there's, there's no kind of means <coughs> of addressing that. And then as uh, Yemen and Boulanger and, and other scholars have talked about, Really, again, this kind of sexual reproductive health rights became refocused as maternal newborn child health. So again, it was about maternal health, child health, newborn health, and that's it. MNCH now. So we have a new term, we have a new category. <coughs> so then, I mean Zaida, I've, I've known Zaida for all these years. And, and, and a lot of women who I've worked with, this is in, in Rajasthan, in Northwest India. Um, and so I keep kind of tracking how they experience and feel and, and go through um, you know, these kind of goals and, and what, what's happening, development. Um, so in 2014, Zahida said to me, Pehle se suthar, means things are better than before. So what is better than before? Um, and I've, I've put up here um, the what's, what's known as this is Hindi translation of the Janani Suraksha Yojana. Uh, this is the Safe Motherhood Program that was started actually in 2005, very much in response to the reproductive health uh, and MDG and 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 goals uh, that that would be that India had signed up to. So the JSY Janani Suraksha Yojana is a uh, uh, a great program actually because it provided cash incentives to women to come and give birth in hospitals. If you were from a rural area, you'd get a certain amount more than if you were in an urban area. Mm, and you were given free services. And I don't know if some of you can actually read this because the list of free services is quite amazing. You know, you're going to have delivery, free delivery in institutions, free cesarean sections, you're going to have free medicines. Um, Free food, a uh, free kind of a uh, blood and urine type tests and diagnostics. Free food again, uh, free blood available if you need it. Uh, because again, you know, in postpartum hemorrhage, women lose blood. Uh, blood is, is really important to prevent maternal mortality, uh, etc. Free transport and things like that. So, um, so for Zahida and and uh, who, you know and her kind of a uh, um, community who lived on the outskirts of, of Jaipur City, public hospitals were actually better places. They welcomed you and there was no hidden sterilization. You could go in and they would actually, you know, you could just have, you know, give birth. There was no hidden sterilization. However, there were still postpartum deaths. That is, the, the, the moment women gave birth, they had to leave the hospital and there was no postpartum care. Um, and this is, and here, you know, I don't have time to go into this, but this 
is despite the fall in traditional birth attendance. So this notion that traditional birth attendants are connected with high levels of maternal mortality is also something that we need to really think about. Um, but also, because there's this huge rush to come to the hospitals, gynecologists in public hospitals say, my God, we can't, we can't deal with this. But also they will say, we have women dying on the table because we don't know them from before. We don't have an obstetric gynecological history. We don't know their anemia levels. They come in with levels of two or three. We cut them open and they just die because they are so weak. So again, these are things that did not get they did not get coverage, that they were, you know, what was happening in this kind of context. As far as contraception was concerned, it was very similar for Zayda as it was before in 1998. As far as abortion was concerned, again, no health-related provision. And also, there was, very interestingly, a continuing rise in sex-selective abortion and child sex ratios continued to be skewed towards boys despite punitive legislation. The Indian state had brought in, you know, they criminalized sex slavery. And so, despite that, we were still, it was, you know, there was continuing kind of skewedness um, in the figures. Okay, so it's really in this context that um, we need to think about this shift now, post 2015, to the SDGs, right? 2015 to 2030. So what, what can we think about in this kind of context? One is just in terms of the framing of the document, very interesting, because there was, uh, again, like in, like in the Cairo context, this was really a shift to a multi-stakeholder dialogue. The NDGs were very much in, you know, uh, a high-level technocratic kind of exercise behind closed doors. Um, where you know development experts were you know involved who were working within the organization and institution. But in the SDGs we have a huge set of I think there were sort of nine different groups and stakeholders, including civil society organizations, you know, uh, scholars, activists, academics, lawyers, etc. Um, and so in terms of that, you know, the the, the, the way it was framed and the way you know, the, the document was put together, it really is a kind of step beyond the NDGs. You find, for instance, that there is a sort of, um, by, by, by moving outside the context of how development is thought about, um, um, you, you have a decentering of, you know, particular kinds of, you know, power, ideas, how, you know, the idea of something is being problematic or not, because you have dialogue. Um, the interesting thing is that rights, in terms of human rights, uh, have moved in the SDGs from the margins, because you can hardly see them in the NDGs, to the center. Um, and also, this kind of need for rights, for the first time, you are actually having people listening to tra transnational feminism. You know, so from 1994 till. 2015, it took that long for people to really think, okay, where are rights? What should we do? Let's do something. And rights are not just there in terms of, you know, rhetoric. Um, I'll come back to that bit later. But they, they are there in terms of some kind of substance as well. So, for example, for the first time, interestingly, you have, you know, that the, the you know, a priority given to human rights over economic interests. So far, development and, and the framing has been very much in sort of standard economic terms, economic progress terms, income, employment, you know, th those kind of things. Um, secondly, sexual reproductive rights are actually linked to global economic issues. Why should we think of them as separate? And this is what, again, you know, transnational feminists have argued right from 1994 that these, you know, rights, sexual reproductive health, these are also main economic issues. We've got to link these things. Um, and then for the first time, there was a decentering of this kind of public health approach, which hasn't really thought about rights as much. You know, public, the public health approach is, you know, um, well, you've got a, a group of 
public health experts at IBS who will go into that. But it's 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 an approach that does that is really um, at least in my view, um, it takes on very much from sort of medical clinical kind of um, ways of looking at things, randomized control trials as being the evidence as, as the gold standard, and etc. So um, for the first time, you know, thinking about you know health in development as being something that required a shift from this from this sort of huge public health approach. And again, like I said, going back to what you know, Pachewski's um, argument uh, right from you know the early kind of millennium is for reproductive rights and sexual rights or health rights to become a material reality. We can actually no longer afford to think of macroeconomic regimes like finance or trade or fiscal policy and human rights regimes as entirely separate discourses of entirely separate worlds. And again, you know, so this, it, it just kind of reinforces what, what, what I've been saying. Um, along, with, along with this kind of view of, of, of human rights, um, there is the SDGs call for a full recognition of, of human rights. Uh, full recognition in terms of a full legal recognition. Because remember, you know, with human rights regimes, it's actually, uh, it's a culture of, of, of law and culture of sort of legalization that comes up. Um, and you, because in other words, rights are guaranteed through the law. Rights are seen very much in a, in a kind of legal uh, context. Um, so you have, um, you know, the, look at the language. You've got to have recognition of equality, non-discrimination, transparency, accountability. These are kind of the basis of, you know, the human rights framework. Also, in terms of thinking about rights, um, you need to have some education. So this is now again we come back to this. What kinds of indicators and how do you how do you make how do you realize rights as you know, people like you know Andrea Cornwall and others have, have, uh, have written on? Um, so you need kind of better operational kind of guidelines, and this is what the SDGs are calling for, and, and and that is you know quite remarkable in terms of development discourse um, at least you know. Um, but but it, that it has taken so long. Let's see how sexual and reproductive health rights are actually situated or located within the SDGs. So as I said when I started out that they are across, there's no one specific <coughs> kind of goal, but they are across several goals. And you know the most, in, you know, at, I mean there are several goals, but I've only taken out uh, you know some of these and the most important are where they come up in terms of human rights language in the goal on equality, gender equality. So 5.1 on ending discrimination against all women and girls, uh, eliminating all forms of violence in the public and private sphere. So you know we've often talked about the public but never the private public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, eliminate kind of, you know, harmful practices like child marriage, early marriage, forced marriage, gender-based violence, um, female gender mutilation, and, and also to set targets for these, um, to have universal kind of access um, to sexual reproductive health rights. Um, in, in target three, and also sort of linking into unpaid care work. So I think you know these are all really ways in which there is some kind of inter, you know, intersectoral kind of way of, of um, that's being promoted here of, of thinking about rights more laterally. Um, in terms of the right to um, health and well-being, which is you know target three, um, it does it does talk about reducing the maternal mortality rate to less than seventy per hundred thousand by twenty thirty. I don't know if you are aware of what the targets were, maybe uh, what the levels were in 1994, for instance, or in 2005. Can you give me an idea? <coughs> Roughly? Just to see the scale at which the, these are kind of ambitious and aspirational. 500? The MDG target was 130 per 1 lakh. 130 yeah, yeah, and before that, uh, it was about 500,000 
um, sort of uh, 500 per 100,000 uh, pregnant women in, in the 1990s. So um, I'll, I'll shortly be putting on my critical astrological hat on, but I just I just wanted to say that um, this is, you know, as as um, I think Dimani mentioned, this is um, uh, from the NDGs, which is up until 2015. It's about 130, 20,000, um, 130 per 100,000 um, uh, as, as a kind of goal, goal to reach. Um, Interestingly, these are global goals, they are not national goals, and this is the difference also with the MDGs. The MDGs were more, they were more country-based, the SDGs are more kind of sort of global. So again, you know, how do you get at that, how do you conceptualize that? Um, and then there's this, this goal, on, um, you know, this sub-goal uh, linked to universal access to sexual reproductive health care services, including for family planning, information, and education, but it's set in along with these other goals in, in number three, um, which is you know to end epidemics, uh, to uh, have universal health coverage, and then it's linked also to the goals of education. The fact that you know empowerment means education uh, for you know people who have been excluded so far. Uh, it means access to water and sanitation. Uh, it means access to jobs um, and employment. Um, the reduction of inequality is a goal in itself and the way it links to um, kind of justice. So these are the, the related kind of goals um, uh, around sexual and reproductive health rights in, in the SDGs. So I think this is, you know, a really, um, this is an aspirational and ambitious kind of document. Um, but there are some things that remain at least from where I can see it. We're only, you know, two or three years down the line within the SDGs. Um, that as yet, what is the understanding of gender equality? How transformative is that understanding of gender equality? Um, is, it, is it really just about treatment or, or going beyond the population aggregate outcomes? Is it just about a focus on women and girls? What is transformative uh, in this? You know, and, and, and how can we think about perhaps more substantive gender equality? So maybe we should be thinking about substantive gender equality. And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. So then the relationship between development and human rights. So there's an interesting kind of um, this slight disjunction here. While the SDGs develop, you know, and can develop systemic cross-sector approaches to health, food, and housing, they can at the same time, and they do conceal inequalities, discrimination, and exclusion. The human rights focus on individual entitlements can actually bring recognition precisely to those bits of, you know, the substantive dimension of equality. For instance, in talking about you know gender justice in access to health services, having a voice in in deciding family planning, participating in you know development uh, goals, um, and these things are really coming up now within human rights conventions and and articles, uh, but they are not so much reflected in the SDGs. So, CEDAW, for instance. Um, which is the elimination of discrimination against all women, um, is a highly progressive gender kind of equality, substantive gender equality based document. And, um, and if you're interested in developing this sort of idea further, looking into it further, I would suggest you have a look at, at, at what CEDAW says about gender equality, how it promotes gender equality. Um, and, and there are other kinds of um, voices that are coming up and, and, and scholarship around it. So, so UN Women is really working on this idea of substantive gender equality. And Sandra Fredman, um, is also, who's a human rights lawyer, is also looking at uh, you know, what it means for, um, for gender equality, human rights and gender equality. What is really interesting is that independently, human rights legislation has moved such that now what is what's happening is that you can you can 
call on human rights law to, you know, uh, if you have been denied services, uh, you know, in terms of access to healthcare, because all these denial of services that lead to maternal mortality, uh, denial of abortion services, or any kind of forced sterilization can be seen as a violation of your right to life, your personal integrity, you know, who you are, your bodily integrity, your autonomy, and your dignity. So, what what these people like you know Fredman and Cedar etc are actually calling for is a more kind of synergistic, synergistic kind of you know working together and interweaving together of human rights ideas within kind of development these SDGs and development kind of um, goals. Um, but one thing seems to be again sort of being left out. And, and this is where I really want to focus on what I call recentering abortion. Because even in this current SDG kind of document, there is a glaring omission of abortion in sexual reproductive health rights, as, as Fredman points out. Um, and see, a, a, now I, I think abortion is one of the most misunderstood kind of um, uh, aspects of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, it's something that has to be addressed across, it truly is something that has to be addressed across the global north and south, as you've seen in the case of Ireland, for instance. But it's also to be addressed within transnational feminism, because you have, particularly in some southern contexts where feminists are silent on abortion, although in others they're not. So an interesting kind of dichotomy between sort of feminists particularly in India who don't really push the agenda of abortion compared to feminists in Latin America who really do push the agenda of abortion. So again, you know, thinking within the southern context and, and thinking across particular, you know, and, and even within northern contexts as I'll come on to say in a minute. But so here, the other thing about abortion is, let's connect, you know, again, sexual reproductive health rights across the context of health, like with, you know, emerging infectious diseases. What you find that, you know, the need, the avoid, you know, needs for abortion are, are also emerging with emerging infectious diseases, such as Zika, or what you have with HIV and AIDS. Um, and similarly, you know, abortion issues within the northern context are also emerging in terms of the health exclusion of particular kinds of minority groups or ethnic minority groups. So, for example, South Asian diasporas, and I'm doing a little bit of work uh, now uh, uh, on sort of sun preference in the UK and how that kind of translates or not into sex selective abortion because some of the UK demographics are showing that there is a slight, very tiny shift in um, women. Um, India born and other, you know, um, South Asian born mothers uh, in terms of the sort of shift towards having more boys than, than girls. So again, you know, again these, you know, this is an issue that affects everyone, it's a universal issue and yet there is, there is absolutely no mention of it in any kind of development world. and yet it's so important in terms of bodily choice, in terms of bodily autonomy. I have put this quote, your body, your choice, because it, I want to signal a shift from my body, my choice. If you have, if you have, you know, your mothers or have uh, in the 60s and 70s have been part of feminist campaigning across the globe, then it was about the personal is political. And it was very much about, you know, bodily autonomy and the right uh, to decide, uh, you know, what to do with your, with your bodies. But I want, to sh I want to signal this shift because, you know, I've been, at, you know, I've been seeing sort of both anti-Trump and, and um, anti-abortion rallies and pro-abortion rallies. And what I was really struck by was when uh, a, an African-Caribbean American man was carrying this poster which said, your body, your choice, along with his, uh, with his partner. And that's it. That's where we need to be, where we have other people joining men joining women in terms of saying your body culture. And when we reach that, then we are going to have much more of a collaboration around reproductive health and rights issues. Uh, at least that's, that's what I think. Um, 
I think also we need to reframe rights beyond the critiques of rights that we have, beyond which, which have been very useful and valuable. That is, we need to reframe rights beyond what are known as the insufficiency of rights. That is, you know, rights are Western concepts, rights um, are removed from local, you know, because you can have, um, you can talk about rights, but what about if you don't have access to the court? Or if you're afraid of the court? Or you don't have money to access the court? How can you get at rights? Okay? So we need to reframe and think about rights. And this is where the anthropological heart comes on, where you need to think about indigenous, the way in which in ideas of bodily autonomy and entitlement are in, you know, come are, are also there in indigenous discourse. We need to look at that and bring that as a voice along with this kind of universal rights paradigm. We need to think about rights as not just individual, but also individual and collective. And this is very interesting work that's been done by Andi and Kuzubara in Nigeria, for instance, um, where you know it's it's the collective group that gives the individual rights. So it's it's not that it's one or the other. Similarly, rights need to be linked to you know the myriad of sexual identities, even reproductive rights. Why do we disconnect reproductive rights from you know sexual? rights or sexual identities. There needs to be a lot of work done on that aspect. Similarly, going back to this notion of what rights are, do we actually know how people think, act, and negotiate around rights? We do need much more work on the ground in trying to understand how rights are negotiated on the ground. Um, and particularly, you know, um, in terms of this last point about thinking about rights differently, maybe slightly differently from a legal only context. So thinking about rights in terms of moral claims, you know, I have the right to do that, I am entitled, this is my claim. How is that discourse, you know, how does that shape, shape up? And how, because that really is important because it brings in more voices. It's a broader, but also in a more embodied way of understanding rights. It's not just something that's a covenant or comes from a declaration, but it's about how you feel and think and act and practice rights on, on, on the ground. So um, finally, I think what you know one has to really talk about reproductive and social justice. It's there as a goal, number 16. But have a look and see what what to you is, is how is justice kind of talked about in the SDGs. I think one of the things is we really also need, we talk about rights, we talk about justice. We need to connect the two. How are rights linked to justice? Are they implicitly linked, are they explicitly linked, etc. Um, the other thing is that reproductive justice, why do we talk about justice? Maybe we should approach rights from the perspective of justice. Because justice is something that is much more morally situated. It's not, it's not an individual in that. It emerges in that context of moral rightness, of how you feel entitled to something, or who gives you the authority. Do you feel empowered or not? Um, and also because rights actually can create new forms of inequalities. Um, so for example, and this is one of this is related to the insufficiency of rights. That is the way in which rights are talked about. They become exclusive. They become the you know they become part of you know development actors and lawyers. You know human rights. There's a human rights, and this is not just me. This is you know people in Sussex. Uh, a lot of scholars in the anthropology department, um, Jane Cowell, Nigel Redfield, talk about how you know this itself has become an exclusionary domain of of, of power. So we need to you know we need to think about this connection and think about how we can uh, work. You know. And then finally, uh, but not the least, is I think we do need to address the violence of indicators. That even though to a large extent the SDGs uh, do address this, but I think the indicators are good. I'm not arguing against quantitative measures. I'm not, I'm not making this divide between qualitative and quantitative. But I think any kind of indicator, even a qualitative indicator, in fact, I'm involved in working out qualitative indicators. I think, yes, they are important, as Mary says, in bringing in accountability. They do have some good functions. But 
these are also the setting process mechanisms of what Foucault is called disciplining. That is, they shape the way you look at um, the development project. You know, the fact that you, it shapes your practice as a development person. Oh, I have to meet that target. So whether it's a local health worker in a place like, you know, Mozambique or uh, uh, Cape Town or uh, India, they are saying, okay, those targets, that's what we've got to meet. And so it, it puts out everything else. It flattens inequalities. You don't see, you're not sensitive to all of that. So I think, I've, I've run out of my time. I think I'm going to kind of stop with that. But these are just some, some reflections. Um, thank you very much, Maya. That was completely compelling and fascinating uh, lecture, and I'm sure you all agree. Um, I thought it, it was particularly wonderful the way that you brought in this, kind of the historical scope and understanding with a really important sense of how these issues are critical to real people's everyday lives, and that, that was that was brilliant. Um, but you've also given us some really um, difficult and important analytical questions to, to, to tussle with, um, particularly, I think, relating to how rights and, and justice intersect with each other. Um, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and nick one little question for myself, if that's okay, while you're formulating your questions, and then, and then we'll... Um, turn over to you for questions, and I think if we, we may have some that uh, come in via Facebook link. Um, I was I was very struck by what you were saying about um, the way that abortion has been left out of, you know, it's, it's not really there within the SDGs, not very clearly. And I wondered if you can comment at all on the politics of that, in a sense, about about how that comes to be the case. I mean, I think, I think some of what you were reflecting on in your very last slide um, goes some way to providing an answer to what you said. Yeah, the, I think you referred to the, the actual negotiations about how to become part of these, these big statements and how abortion got left out. I mean, I think I think if you actually even go back to um, the post Cairo, you know, cons like the consensus at ten, which is that sort of you know uh, the the document um, that is looking at some of the ways in which you know what what Cairo did with Cairo did move forward. One of the things was there was this kind of backlash, and and the backlash has been most most kind of virulent and most focused on abortion. Mm -hmm. It sort of gets everyone's, you know, um, and, and this is where I think that it is, it, it is a, a very misunderstood kind of context and, and yet it's so important for women. I mean, I think, I think, so the backlash is both, you know, fun, really fundamentalist readers, but it's also kind of patriarchal discourse, but it's, in, it's also women who, you know, um, say that we, and, and this is where we come at two different kind of contexts of rights, reproductive rights. One is where, um, you know, reproductive rights in a kind of northern context, and I should have started with that, but one, one of the things about reproductive rights is that it's about, at least here in terms of bodily autonomy, it's about the right to sort of control childbearing and to terminate um, you know, that, that's, so, so reproductive rights is about, uh, you know, the pill and contraception and abortion. In the context, particularly in the Indian context, reproductive rights is very much, the, the very term reproductive rights, which means janani adhikar, you know, so, so this means the right to have children. So in that context where you are thinking about rights as the right to have children, there, people say, well, what are you banging on about sort of, you know, reproductive rights? We have that, we've just got to ensure that, we've just got to make sure that the state doesn't control our bodies in terms of sterilization. So, so I think that 
firstly, there are very different ways of approaching reproductive rights, and that plays into this. That plays into this kind of, uh, you know, this is, oh, it's, it's about you know stopping our our childbearing, which is why I can understand why some of the southern feminists aren't, you know, they haven't sort of pushed for this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's I, really, I think that's really, that's really useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, do we have any questions in the room? Oh, lots of hands up. Should we take uh, maybe th three quick, quick questions first at a time? So, should we, yes? Um, so, I was really interested when you talked about um, skilled birth attendance versus unskilled birth attendance and, um, and how it's, it, um, you know, Death, you know, postpartum death or anything like that aren't related, could not possibly be related directly to unskilled birth attendance. And I was wondering from from your work um, around uh, seeing how, how things work with unskilled birth attendance, how is it, what have you seen in terms of whether that is true, whether that is not true, and and this, this whole dynamic of, you know, being very readily discarding traditional knowledge and the power dynamic. Um, today in class we discussed law and development and so um, we discussed uh, informal customary um, laws and formal laws and how they how they merge or how you know. Um, so do you think the unsuccessful implementation of these laws of, of um, you know, human rights laws, sexual reproductive laws, is it an implementation problem? And um, if a more participatory approach would be better, meaning you know, communities are asked and about their own experiences and how they it sort of sort of empowering them to to resolve these issues. Back there on the left. Okay. Uh, my question relates to the use of language, uh, the rights and the transformation language that is used in the Do you think that uh, by use of this language, the new liberals have actually brought the commercial determinants of health into the whole sexual reproductive health today? Like use of modern modality, pointing out specific diseases, using the skilled and versus unskilled language that is being used in all of these frameworks of these objects? Yes, yes. So, okay, hi. So, so with the skilled birth attendants, I think um, what is, you know, what's really interesting is <coughs> that um, the notion of participatory development is that if you're going to take, you know, healthcare, you're going to try and communicate that to uh, you know, you want people to come to clinics and you want people to you know, take medication and stuff, then you, the, the best might be to involve someone from the community. So a lot of the early sort of 1950s, 1960s uh, uh, programs for, uh, you know, promoting health in, in the Indian context was uh, really focused around, um, and, and, and birth particularly, because maternal mortality was already seen as something that was uh, quite um, uh, problematic and difficult. Um, that, that we would we would engage the Dai, that is the local sort of midwife, in in these programs because she would be the best. She uh, has you know um, knowledge of of uh, particular kind of knowledge um, and also knows the woman. Uh, then there was a shift uh, by saying, well, uh, these women don't actually. We need to train them. They need to have some medical expertise. So then there was a shift towards training uh, the, you know, these women, which was then um, also found to be lacking. But alongside all this training and you know, all that, what was less focused upon was the fact, you know, what did the training actually mean to these women? How were they engaging with this training? What was taught? How did they understand it? What was, you know, what were the trainers engaging with the conceptual frameworks of birth and the body and sexuality and reproduction and menstrual problems and you know all those categorizations, you know, that wasn't looked at. Right? It was just how are these women doing and and in a sense, I mean what people who worked in anthropologists who worked in Nepal and other bits of you know, Bangladesh and 
uh, uh, Pakistan and, and India as well have found is that you know in a way that you know this they were easy targets to win for maternal mortality. Okay. So that's that is really what what happened. And and it's I don't want to romanticize you know these lives um, because yes there there were birth, there, there was a sense in which their knowledge was limited, right? But from the work that I've done with some, some of these uh, midwives, uh, they are very, they're very aware of that. And they say, and they have rules where they say, this didn't happen, we could have, then I took this person to the hospital, you know? So, so I think that, that, that easy blame and shame, you know, in, in order, doesn't, doesn't really work. And, and to be very honest, I mean, I think that the, the, the WHO recommendation to not actually not even have these midwives be trained at all, or even part of any program, completely disconnects you know the, the women in these communities from from the health. <coughs> there is no connection, even if it was to whatever you know. And they've done that with Asha health workers, and that's a whole other story, and we can we can come on to that. But I. <laughs> We can maybe discuss it later. Um, so the second question was about um, customary laws and whether it's it's about or, or just legal procedures and, and whether it's an implementation problem. So I think one of the things is that we fail to see that even lawyers are people who belong to particular cultural patriarchal contexts. So for example, you know, in you know, the people who I talked to who were lawyers kept kept you know, at least I'm not saying that all of them did that, but I, I think many important men who were lawyers kept talking about that it, women have to first complete their duties and then talk about their rights. So, so I think this is this is really problematic. And it's, so the implementation—it's not just about implementing laws or not implementing. It's about the whole procedure. How is the person who is making the law or implementing connected to it? How do they view these things? What are their perceptions, you know, of gender equality? And in a way, gender inequality is normalized in this context. It's normalized, you know, that, that women are not different, but also that they have certain things to do. It's, it's not that men are, you know, men are also different. They also have certain duties and responsibilities. But somehow when it comes to, particularly to do with childbearing or control over childbearing, um, it is seen to be completely kind of in the hands of, um, uh, not in the hands of women. It's because they are not seen as um, rational enough to uh, make these decisions. And again, people have written about this. It's not, it's not just me saying that. But, but this notion, it's, it's a kind of very naturalized way that women are associated with childbearing and so they, they take all the responsibility, but they don't have any of the rights. So I don't know if that's kind of sort of answered your, your question. But I, I do think, yes, to a large extent, people don't know about rights either. So I think so I think one of the ways, one of the more positive ways of looking at this is to think about legal activism. And there are a number of people who are on a number of, you know, sort of feminists and, and health activists who also kind of combine with lawyers uh, on the ground. And, and, and they are the ones, I think, who are really bridging that gap. And I think we need to really, you know, give. And, and, and what's good is that, you know, these kind of people are also then coming on to coming on board in terms of implementing policies, you know, developing um, sustainable development agendas and things like that. So, so there is hope. There is not. Um, so the, the final one about sort of this kind of neoliberal kind of aspect to this transformative language, whether there's a neoliberal twist, whether we're thinking about sort of commercial determinants of health. So I think the interesting thing is that that is linked to the insufficiency of rights. That is, that rights and its focus on the individual also lead them to, uh, for instance, a market in health, you know. And, and so I think that, that that's one of the problems with rights. Uh, is is the kind of way it opens out away from you know with this focus on the individual away from the social. Um, so I think I think there's definitely that that needs to be uh, you know. But I but but in terms of uh, a, a kind of uh, a particular neoliberal agenda, uh, again I think that was 
perhaps more in the MDGs, I don't know, but, but less so because of the diffusion of the stakeholders and the kinds of people who came together and, you know, health activists, etc. In, in developing these goals. Okay, that's great. Okay, we have another round of questions. I was wondering if you have um, any advice on how to combat a form of response um, when governments um, don't want to or are really reluctant to sign on to S um, RHR commitments that do have abortion included within them because they see that's not part of their culture or as part of cultural supremacy or cult like Western cultural imperialism. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the issue again of abortion that, um, sorry, I forgot to you. Yes. you had raised earlier, so and the politics around that and, you know, the uh, critique, if you like, that some Southern feminists are silent on that. Um, so maybe you could just clarify that a little bit, because I think also, I mean, some of this, well, all feminists, including Southern feminists, are in a context, right? And there might be all these other values that uh, impact on uh, their belief system. Let's say, for example, religion, or, you know, just because you're feminist doesn't necessarily mean you might not have certain religious beliefs that might impact on your values, that kind of thing. Um, and then you, you sort of point out that it's, it's a real problem the way people view abortion, but then um, what's the alternative? Like, how can we actually move that conversation, conversation forward? Yeah, again, I have a question on, on language. Um, it seems like when we talk about the body, we talk about real people, it's, it's very inclusive, we talk about individuals, Abortion is relevant, and men are also included um, when you're talking about uh, your body, your choice, rather than my body, my choice. And I just wonder if the grand framework of the SDGs and then the MDGs have led to a focus on measurement and statistics, on reports, and actually are we losing the real conversation which needs to be much broader when it comes to human rights, justice, and uh, reproductive health. health. So, um, I think we go with the last one first because I absolutely agree with you. So, I mean, I think I think that's exactly that's exactly. Um, I mean, you know, what what I was trying to argue was that we do need a kind of embodied approach because the moment we have an embodied approach to development. You know, we bring in, we have those kind of conversations, and people move from being numbers and targets to people and to persons. And one of the slides I, I didn't put on here was, you know, exactly those feminist ethical principles, which is about, you know, personhood is important, you know, self identity, who is the self, and also, you know, who is it in relation to people, how you experience things. You know, in, in, you know, the subjective is important. Why do we not? Um, take that into account, um, and even even this whole thing about you know including you know men and and um, sort of masculinities and and all that. I mean again that has had that has come into things again in a very siloed way where they you know you only talk about men when it comes to sex, sexualities or or HIV and AIDS and you know sexual health kind of programs. What about the connections? You know what about sort of you know men are also we couldn't have had reproduction if it wasn't for men. Um, number one. So you know, but also men, sh you know, can can also help in women's reproductive health issues. So they can come in that way as well. Um, so there's a whole, you know, in fact, in fact, the notion of infertility, which isn't looked at, uh, you know, also affects both men and women. So the fact that you know you have, in fact, uh, my sense is that that in 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 Britain, for instance, you have a high number of. Uh, infertile men. I mean, in a lot of these European contexts also, there's a declining fertility rate linked to this kind of infertility. And again, these are issues about rights because you don't get help in clinics or it's very expensive and, you know, so it's a global issue, it's a north issue, south issue. And so, okay, so um, just to say that I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that, um, 
you know. But the, but the point is, and and it it comes down to the indicators, you know, and and the anxiety around indicators. And where does the anxiety around indicators come from? I mean, is that also perhaps located within a kind of you know, um, uh, enlightenment discourse post sort of Descartes, 18th, 19th century in this part of the world where we have really got to get those indicators, you know. Maybe it's also about uh, a nirvana from indicators, I don't know, you know. So, um, don't quote me on that anyway, because <laughs> um, going back to, uh, so, so the thing about governments are reluctant to sign up, you know, to um, to these issues, and I think that really is is an issue, and that's one of the things that people have picked up with the SDGs as well, is that you see they're not enforceable, so you cannot be prosecuted, you know, and that's so, so they become weak, they become weak exactly, and that's why with, and that's with the NDGs and with the you know other goals before that that you can just ignore them. Or you can say you are doing something and then you know just show you've changed the name, it's now all about safe motherhood and this and that, and you have been doing things, but actually you're not doing anything on the ground. It's still the same, everything's still the same. The targets are there, you know, the focus on family planning in a coercive way is there, sterilization is there. So um, how do we make these, you know, and, and I think people's referendum. I mean, that's what swung sort of, you know, with the Irish abortion kind of context. I think you need, you need to have that kind of, you know, solidarity, you need to have that kind of activism, you need to speak out, you need to, you know, now with social media, you can gain that kind of platform. So, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's my, my view. I mean, I, do you have a better view? And, if, you know, and, and it would be good to hear if anybody wants to contribute to that, because how do we make these issues, you know? Um, uh, how do we mobilize around these issues and, and have that journey of the concept really in a way that ends with you know it actually being taken on board in policy terms and um, so and then on the on the issue of um, you know sort of abortion politics and um, sort of the context of it um, so I've forgotten what what was it can you just remind me what what were you um, were saying about I it? Think, I think I if you could just like make the point a little bit uh, clearer, like, um, or for example, comment on the fact that, uh, say, you know, with the critique of Southern feminists mm -hmm. and their silence on abortion, like, what's your view around maybe the context that they're situated in and their own personal beliefs, yeah. like, yeah. you know, the, the issues around that, for example, and how do we move the conversation forward? Yeah. So I think I think that is a, that is an important one, and I think that that is also connected with, you know in a way busting the myths around abortion. I think that is really so it's you know it's like you can have a law that says you know abortion is legal. Doesn't mean everyone's going going in for an abortion. So why not have that law so that people who have undergone for you know rape or have you know underage women who are you know who've had sex and who are pregnant and who are stigmatized or you know that the option is there. You know you can you can decide um, if you don't want, because you know, if you don't want to bring up a child, or even having a child who reminds you of, you know, looking at the, the context of, you know, I don't know, you know, particularly conflict situations where, um, you know, women get forcibly kind of, you know, pregnant. Um, you should have that option to to and 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 so even along sort of, you know, the um, in terms of thinking about religion, so. It is, it's not lightly, I mean the other myth is that women go in for abortion very lightly and it's never a light decision, it's never an easy decision, you know, and, and it's, and, and I think that um, the sort of, what makes it harder is when you can't talk to anybody about it, when you are actually having sort of issues with it and you, you, you really, you know, don't want to have the child. So I think you need to have a right to have children, but you also need to have a right to not have children if you don't want to have children. So, and, and, and I think that, that there needs to be a lot more sort of work done around that in terms of engaging with people's own ideas and beliefs. And it, it doesn't mean that we, we are saying go and have an abortion. No, not at all. It was like the same kind of thing with contraception. 
that by bringing contraception, everybody's then going to have more sex, you know. So, I mean, this seems to be the rev a reverse kind of logic at work, if you see what I mean. I think, you know, so, anyway, you know, if you have your beliefs, you don't have to have abortion, but at least let others who want to have it, have it. Um, and there's so much work in this. I mean, India had the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act already from, you know, I think it was 1971, much even, much before Roe and Wade and much before the US and, you know. Um, but no one ever activates it, you know. The, no one ever uses it. Um, not even young people. And there's a whole set of younger unmarried people living together now in India. And they live in fear. Of, of pregnancy, of their contraceptive not working. That's the other thing. The contraceptive, you may use it, but they don't always work. So, you know, so again, you know, these, these kinds of things, they, they need so much more sort of, um, you know, work, work around that. So, anyway, I hope I... Yeah, thanks. That was great. And we've got time for another question or two. Yeah. Would you like to... Yeah. So actually, we have a question on Twitter. It's not my question. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Lady, she was a leading scholar in this concept. So, she said, what's your views on creating positive narratives of improper sexuality that do not focus only on violence, suffering, or rights violations, mm -hmm. but also pleasure? So, what are your views on that? You know, and 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 you know, and, and that's where again contraceptives are are important. Why? Because they can disconnect this fear of you know every time you have have sex, you're going to have a child. When you use contraceptives, you can you know enjoy having sex. So uh, and these these are the positive narratives. But but the point is they've been submerged. And the point is that again you know who submerges them? Why are they submerged? How can we recover these? You know. So I, I absolutely agree, and I think that therein lies the solution itself. That is, we need to find ways of recovering these these kind of uh, positive narratives. And but unless people get together, are informed, communicate, um, and I don't tweet, but you know, I, I totally uh, you know get the the tweeting thing. I think tweeting is important. That's exactly um, what what we need to do. So I, I'm, I'm and and I think actually Liri is doing a lot of that. Liri is also. Uh, a lawyer working on reproductive rights, and so she's taking on board exactly some of these issues that we've been talking about, about how to reframe, make reproductive rights more kind of in a way palatable uh, to lawyers and the, and the legal sort of and, and, and the legal framework. Um, so to the so to the question about the solutions, yes, I mean it's, solutions are always kind of um, difficult when they're thought about in these kind of broad broad ways. But I think that, you know, it is about attacking power structures. And I think, you know, one has to first recognize that the SDGs have done that to a certain extent. They have moved, you know, in terms of having all these different voices participate in a similar platform. And, and you know, even the idea about, you know, addressing violence and sexual health rights have emerged despite all the backlash are actually, you know, they are actually written in the SDGs. So, by bringing human rights kind of frameworks in, and in particular kinds of human rights frameworks, we can kind of evoke that, you know, invoke that kind of violation of 
this violation of, you know, as a way of addressing these issues. So, for instance, one of the interesting things in um, uh, amongst legal aid activists in India, there's, there's a wonderful group called the Human Rights Law Network that works in um, Delhi. Um, they won an outstanding case uh, against maternal mortality by invoking the right to life kind of and the right to dignity and these kind of clauses in making, you know, when, when someone died in a hospital <coughs> because they weren't given proper care. So it's to ensure that, you know, and I think, and I think with, with more information, you know, um, and, and, and by the way, this information um, needs to be there. I'm totally for kind of, you know, in schools, um, you know, education. And so open up the thing about sex and reproductive education. It's not just about, you know, the stalks and the bees and the, you know, that kind of thing. But open it up to these kinds of issues, you know, uh, uh, get the young on board. I mean, they are the, they are the future, they are the hope, you know, really. So. Um, I think that that's a really, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. It's at different levels, but, you know, we can all do something. Okay. Okay, one last pressing question, and then, and then we will call it today. Okay. It's probably the last Thank you. I don't know if it's a pressing question, but it might be a good one to end on. Um, thank you, Maya, that was brilliant. Um, and I really like the point that you made at the end about the violence of indicators and what they do. And I was just thinking about how that related to the question about pleasure. And I was wondering if one of the ways to address that idea of the violence of indicators might be to move towards having indicators about good sex and pleasure. And I wonder if you think that's something that there's potential to do. Thanks, Janet, because um, I know that, you know, you're, in fact, you know, you, you come to mind precisely in that issue about sort of education and so, so Janet works a lot on education uh, around these issues um, in schools in, in the UK. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really important. But, but, I, but your point about having indicators, uh, I think that's a fabulous point. And um, the, 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 the whole problem with it, we, I think we do need these indicators around sexual pleasure and stuff to kind of combat, as it were, or to you know put the other indicators in in in, in some. So so a lot of work needs to be done around that. And one of the things that I've been working on is opening up that box of sort of evidence because um, you know with with the World Health Organization they have since 2013 been trying to develop ways of saying, well, you know, what are, the ben what are the benefits of human rights and how can we measure human rights? And particularly to some of the countries that are saying we don't want human rights at all. So how do you, how do you convince them that actually having human rights is, a, is, a, is an important and good thing? Um, but, but you can't have, you know, those indicators that you have for public health indicators, which are, you know, around these random control trials, you have evidence, so many people have gotten better, therefore you can use that drug. So you can't have that with, with human rights. So what you need is a different approach to evidence. You need a more kind of plausible rather than probable focus on evidence. The fact that something can happen, it has happened, and we all believe it's happened, we all know about maternal mortality, it's happening. Um, and, then, and, and it's the reason, reasonableness of something happening that itself can be an indicator, that itself can be used. So stories, documents, you know, people's experiences can all feed into that. And I think that that um, becomes a way of having, uh, you know, having kind of positive indicators that are also taking on board those embodied aspects, those interpretive and subjective mm -hmm. aspects. We need those kind of interpretive. So I'm absolutely, you know, I'm absolutely for that. I, I just, I'm also concerned that those then become, you know, how will they become disciplining mechanisms? Mm -hmm. But I think then that is a further thing to think about. But we first need, you know, that mm -hmm. step. So that's how I would... Uh, Thank you, what a, what a great note to end on. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, really, I really, you know, took from this as a kind of one of the, the kind of overarching themes that in the in the context of of gender inequality, the complexity of gender inequality, and also um, issues of personhood, very kind of individualized stuff. The whole question about whether the SDGs are, are limiting the conversation around that is, is really, really important. Um, 
but I'm really also waiting to hear the development of your your uh, Carte your critique of the Cartesian approach to indicators as well. <laughs> that would be great. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to say um, a couple of things. One is thank you very much for all of your fascinating contributions. Um, the second is to remind you of the next SDL, which is, you may already know about it, 6th of December, where Hilary Cotton is coming to talk. Uh, her, her talk is on radical help, why we need a social revolution to uh, achieve the SDGs, which I'm sure will be absolutely fascinating. Um, and lastly, oh, and to thank all of the people who are still online. Um, and uh, lastly, a huge thank you to Maya for an absolutely brilliant, Hello, lecture. Thank you.